Can you all hear me in the back? No? Hmm. Um, I'll try again. I'm Roberta Abraham, and I'm uh, chair of the Interdisciplinary Linguistics Program here at Iowa State. Am I all right now? Yeah? Okay. Right, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the 1991-92 uh, uh, Quentin Johnson Linguistics Lecture. Um, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to tell you um, why this is the Quentin Johnson Linguistic Lecture. Uh, Quentin Johnson was a professor in the English department for many years, and in addition to teaching uh, the literature and, and composition courses there, he began to introduce linguistics courses to the curriculum. Um, and as he found other people around campus interested in linguistics, he and they together formed the Interdisciplinary Linguistics Program. Um, Quentin was a wonderful professor, a wonderful teacher, and a wonderful colleague. And when he died in 1986, uh, those of us who knew and loved him decided that we wanted to name the lecture series in his memory. So that's, that's why it's named as it is. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Barbara Parchi, who is head of the Department of Linguistics and Distinguished University Professor of Linguistics and Philosophy at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Uh, Barbara's research interests cluster around issues in and about semantics, including its foundations and its relation to syntax and to pragmatics, to logic and philosophy of language, and to cognitive and represent representational theories of language and she's published many articles and books on these topics. Um, last summer, Carol Chappelle, who's another faculty member in uh, the English department, and I met Barbara at the uh, Linguistic Society of America's Summer Institute. Um, Barbara held a Sapir professorship at the institute and taught an advanced seminar on quantification and semantic typology. But she also gave a general lecture uh, on work that she's doing, and Carol and I were so impressed with her ability to make complex issues understandable that we invited her to come to Iowa State to give this uh, our annual lecture. And we were delighted when she said she would do it. And um, after many um, email messages back and forth between Ames and Amherst to get things settled and a little cooperation from the weatherman, uh, we have her here tonight. So it's my pleasure to introduce Barbara Partee, who will speak on pet fish and midget giants Stereotypes, Concepts, and the Composition of Meaning. Thank you, Roberta, and it's very much my pleasure to be here tonight. So th the starting point for the things I want to talk about tonight um, have to do with the, the way certain vague concepts enter into uh, the meaning of sentences and larger expressions in language. In most work that's been done uh, up until now, it's been a common assumption, often just a simplifying assumption, um, that the, the concepts expressed by most of the simple words, the nouns, adjectives, verbs of natural language, are or can be idealized to be sharp yes or no concepts. This is true <laughs> in linguistics, in the psychology of concept formation, and in logic. So that, for instance, a simple color word like yellow uh, is taken to express a concept whose extension can be thought to be the set of all yellow things. And we think of that as a definite set. Something is or is not a member of the set of, of yellow things. And the question, is X yellow, has a definite yes or no answer. Um, standard set theory, which is used as the basis for most work in contemporary formal semantics uh, models set membership as a sharp all or none, yes or no matter. Now, of course, we know that, in fact, lots of the simple words in ordinary language are not so sharp. Their, their, uh, their boundaries are vague. And one of the interesting developments of recent decades was the development by Eleanor Roche and colleagues and subsequent workers of what, what she called prototype theory, a theory designed to address the observation that not all concepts really are sharp, and that for many concepts, it may be more appropriate to model them not in terms of 
set membership in an all or none, in or out uh, way, but in terms of resemblance to a to prototype or resemblance to a clearest example, um, which is a matter of degree, not a matter of sharp yes or no. Examples that have been suggested uh, in the literature on prototype theory include, for instance, furniture, uh, where um, the question of whether a sofa is a piece of furniture, everybody will agree is, it has a yes answer. Are table lamps furniture? Well, you, you pause a minute, you say probably yes. You get to table lamps or ironing boards, and it's much less clear that they're, they're furniture. Furniture, even chair itself, since the line between a chair and a stool may not be sharp. Tool, uh, bird, fish, cup, fruit, various kinds of words. Uh, and evidence has come from a variety of converging experimental tests. Uh, so, for instance, one kind of experimental paradigm is to just ask people to list all the kinds of furniture they can think of and then see which items appear most frequently on such lists. Uh, another kind of paradigm is to ask people, are table lamps furniture? And to measure their reaction time, how long it takes them to say yes, even if they do say yes, as well as how many say yes and how many say no. Yet another paradigm is to ask people to write down all the properties of furniture they can think of, and then in a separate task, ask them to write down properties of chairs, properties of tables, etc. And see, and, and one observes that, for instance, sofas have more of the properties that people most often list as properties of furniture. And table lamps have some of the properties, but not all of the properties that people typically list. And the fact that many different experimental paradigms tend to converge on the judgment that, for instance, a sofa is a prototypical piece of furniture and a table lamp is a marginal uh, member of the category of furniture, or that a robin is a very good example of a bird and a penguin is a more questionable example of a bird, for instance. Uh, the results have been rather robust and have, have uh, led to a great deal of very fruitful research. Now, there still can be questions about what the relation is between this notion of prototypes and some concepts having best examples and graded uh, degrees of, of uh, better and worse examples. What the relation is between such a theory and the, the underlying semantics of our basic predicate words, the words like bird, furniture, etc. Does it mean that the meanings of these words are to be modeled in terms of something like prototype theory? And Osherson and Smith, in a, an important article in 1981, mm -hmm. raised doubts about prototype theory as a theory of concepts suitable for the underpinnings for semantics and theories of, of uh, conceptual combination, doubts which ar arise from the concern that an adequate theory of concepts should be able to account for compound concepts, how we put con concepts together to, to form more complex concepts, uh, and the mechanisms of conceptual combination, as well as giving insight into simple concepts. So our work, and oh, and I should mention, by the way, as you may see on the, on the handout, I, sh I should have stopped and said, I hope everyone has access to a handout. If you don't have one yourself, I hope you're sitting near someone who has one, because I will refer to the handout from time to time. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't uh, bring enough, but uh, we underestimated the uh, size of the audience. As you see at the top of the handout, this is joint work that I'm talking about. So I'll, I'll take all the blame for this talk, but the research represented here is joint with the colleague Hans Kamp, who is now at the University of Stuttgart. So when I say we, I mean Hans, Hans and I. Um, so so uh, we, our work takes off from the work of Osherson and Smith. We agree with them on some of their concerns, on some of the concerns they, w they raise, we re-diagnose the problems, and then there are some new problems that we've found in the course of trying to uh, look at their concerns. So to give, a, to give a preview of some of the sample problems that I'll be concerned with here tonight, 
Uh, one is, how does the concept of pet fish relate to the concepts of pet and of fish? Um, this is a case where it looks like prototype theory is not going to be very helpful in explaining the compound concept because um, a guppy or a goldfish might be a close to prototypical pet fish, but that's very far from either a prototypical pet or a prototypical fish. And it's not clear how one could take any notion of a prototype of a pet and a prototype of a fish and put them together and get a compound concept from which you could predict that a guppy or a, or a goldfish would be a prototypical pet fish. Now, that's, there's an observation, but you can still ask, does that cast any doubt on prototype theory, or does that suggest that this is a case where uh, the prototype is not determinative of the meaning? And that's, that's one kind of issue. Uh, another kind of problem is with expressions like apple, which is not an apple. This, this we take to be a contradictory concept. I'll talk later about the fact that you might question whether it really is contradictory. But we'll take it to be a contradictory concept, but on some versions of prototype theory it will be predicted not to be. And that's one, one problem that Osherson and Smith uh, raised that we also discuss further. Another issue uh, that arose out of our own extensions of this work is that giant midgets are not the same as midget giants, and we want to know why not, and how we all know in what way midget giants and giant midgets uh, are different. Uh, and another question is, how do words like sharp shift their understood ranges, that is the understood sense of how sharp does something have to be to count as sharp? Um, how do they shift in, in the different contexts, like knives are sharp versus this knife is sharp? Uh, the interests of these questions is partly technical. These are, this is partly a concern for how to do compositional semantics. I'll say a little about that. But I think the interest should also be more general. It, it, these kinds of questions may give us some insight into the versatility and adaptability of our cognitive mechanisms for interpreting vague expressions uh, in changing contexts. And thinking about this kind of issue a bit can even help us appreciate how the existence of vague words uh, and context-dependent expressions in natural languages may be an advantage and not a disadvantage for a language which is meant to have an application to an unlimited range of subject matter. So let me begin with a little bit of background on the notion of compositionality, because this, this issue of how we compose concepts to make uh, the, to understand larger concepts is at the heart of these concerns. The principle of compositionality, which uh, many of us trace back to the philosopher Frege uh, of the 19th century, uh, is, is this. The meaning of a complex expression is a function of the meanings of its parts and of their syntactic mode of combination. Now, on some level, we take this to be almost a truism. In, in, in some sense, the principle of compositionality must be correct uh, to explain the fact that we're able to understand combinations of words and phrases that we've never heard before. Um, but in order to make the principle specific and really something that you can empirically test and get your teeth into, it needs, a, it needs further specification of a number of crucial terms in it. So it requires specification of the nature of the meanings of the smallest parts, what we take the, these meanings that we're trying to combine to be. That's a theory, that's where you need a theory of lexical semantics. You need a specification of the relevant structure of parts and wholes uh, for complex expressions. That's, that means you need a theory of the semantically relevant level or levels of syntax. And you need a specification of the notion of what you mean is a function of, when you say the meaning of a whole is a function of the meanings of the parts. That's a, that means you need a theory of what kind of combinatorial semantic operations natural languages employ, and how the rules for combining meanings operate on lexical meanings and syntactic structure to produce the meaning of the whole. In short, a theory of semantics. That's a large part of what semantics is concerned with. Now let me illustrate this a little bit 
uh, by talking about the semantics of adjective noun combinations. This is meant both to illustrate the kinds of investigations that people interested in compositional semantics go through, and it will also be important because most of the compound concepts that we'll talk about are adjective noun combinations or sometimes noun noun combinations. One of the earliest theories of um, of the semantics of adjective noun combinations came from the work of Katz and Fodor in the early 1960s. They modeled most simple predicate words like adjectives and nouns as decomposed into bundles of some sorts of primitive semantic features. So bachelor would be decomposed into unmarried, adult, male, things of that sort. So an adjective was represented in terms of some set of features, say F1, F2, F3. A noun was represented in terms of some set of features, say F4, F5, and F6. And the adjective noun combination was taken to be just the summation of those features. So the adjective, the meaning of the adjective noun combination would be just F1, F2, F3, F4, F5, F6. Um, now this, this was um, quickly, see, this whole general approach was seen to be not terribly adequate because it didn't give us a clue of what to say about the meanings of other kinds of words like transitive verbs that have a subject and an object and can't just be thought of as an unstructured set of features, or not to mention determiner words like every and, and each. But also it represented in, in one form the hypothesis that adjectives and nouns are just individual predicates and to put them together is basically just to conjoin them. Now this hypothesis can also be expressed by uh, calling it the intersection hypothesis as I have in 2.2.2 in on the handout. Uh, that is a simple and appealing hypothesis about the compositional semantics of adjective noun combinations uh, in, in terms of more contemporary semantic um, theoretical foundations is that both adjectives and nouns denote sets uh, and the combination is just set intersection or equivalently predicate conjunction. So an adjective like carnivorous is taken to denote the set of carnivorous entities. An a, a noun like mammal is taken to denote the set of mammals. And then the combination carnivorous mammal just is taken to denote the things that are both carnivorous and mammals, which is the intersection of those two sets. Um, now this turns out to be appropriate for some but not all adjectives. And adjectives for which this, this notion is appropriate are called intersective adjectives because they have this property that you can model their semantics uh, by set intersection. And in fact, in, in all of the work to which prototype theory might be expected to apply, uh, we, can, we can argue that its range should be limited to just the intersective adjectives. So when I come back to prototype theory, I'll be limiting attention to this set of adjectives, adjectives where you can say the adjective denotes a property, the noun denotes a property, their combination is basically the conjunction of those properties. But we have to talk about some other adjectives because otherwise a lot of things that look like counterexamples to prototype theory may really be matters of trying to apply it to cases that are outside its, its appropriate range. So let's talk for a moment about some non-intersective adjectives. Um, so whereas carnivorous has the property represented as in three that, that the meaning, and when I put these double lines, I mean the meaning of the expression inside them. The meaning of carnivorous plus some noun is just the intersection of the meaning of carnivorous with the meaning of noun, or at least the extension is. That's not true for skillful. That's not true that, that the combination of skillful and noun just denotes the intersection of skillful things with whatever set the noun denotes. And we test for that with a little sample inference pattern as in five. Suppose Mary is a skillful surgeon, and suppose further that Mary is a violinist. Does it follow that Mary is a skillful violinist? No. Right. But if skillful was just denoting a set that was to be intersected with the corresponding noun set, then if she's a skillful, sur skillful surgeon, she's skillful, 
and if she's also a violinist, then she should be a skillful violinist. So this is evidence that skillful is not an intersective adjective. It is, however, what we call a subsective adjective because at least we can be sure that a skillful surgeon must be a surgeon. So at least it keeps you within the noun set, so to speak. Some adjectives are not even subsective. So look down in seven, former, alleged, and counterfeit. Not only is former not intersective, that is, it's not the case that a former sen senator is a former entity and a senator, uh, but in fact the former senators are not even a subset of the senators. Um, and similarly for alleged uh, or, or counterfeit. So it seems that the most general uh, treatment is that we must regard adjectives in the, in the most general case as denoting functions from intentions or properties to intentions or properties. And this is something that's been developed by Richard Montague and others in the Montague grammar tradition. Um, and I won't, I won't try to talk about that in any detail here. Uh, but the the intersective or extensional adjectives are a large subclass, but they're not the general case. That's, that's the important thing I want to emphasize here. And we should limit the, the testing of prototype theory to the case of intersec intersective adjectives, because if we go beyond that class, we can be sure in advance that, that uh, we'll get things that look like counterexamples to prototype theory, and they may just be testing it on inappropriate cases. Now, there's a further complication for even the simple intersective adjectives, and that's the phenomenon of context dependence, which is really crucial as soon as we get into looking at vague terms. When you, when you try that test for intersective adjectives that I gave in the case of Mary is a skillful uh, violinist, etc., some adjectives, which I believe are extensional, but are vague and context dependent, will appear to fail that test for reasons that I think we need to give a separate explanation for. <laughs> so I have in mind adjectives like tall and heavy and old and large and hot, etc. Try this, for instance. If we say John is a tall man, John is a basketball player, does it follow that John is a tall basketball player? First, first inclination is no. Now, so is that just like skillful? Is tall just like skillful in being non-intersective? Well, I think the answer is no. And the difference between tall and skillful is that although tall picks out a class, I believe tall picks out a class of things that are tall, things that are not tall, what class that is varies with the context. And unlike the case of skillful, we can get those context-dependent effects to show up even when we keep the same noun with them. So look at 13 A and B. Uh, combining tall with the noun snowman, I can get two different um, con contextual uh, delimitations of how tall we're going to count as tall by changing the rest of the sentence. If I say, my two-year-old built a really tall snowman yesterday, and we think, under what circumstances will we count that as true or false? And compare that with the DU fraternity brothers built a really tall snowman last weekend and ask how tall we're going to require it to be before we're willing to count that as true. We realize it's very different in the two cases. And it's not because of the noun it combined with, because it was the same noun in both cases. So this. The one one uh, other linguistic diagnostic for these differences is uh, in the case of, of tall, one will often say tall for what a two-year-old could do or tall for a snowman built by a two-year-old versus with skillful. We don't say she's very skillful for a violinist but not skillful for a surgeon. We say skillful as a violinist but not as a surgeon. So the, the for a class where we're just saying there's some contextual set that we're comparing with, those, I believe, we still want to treat as ordinary, extensional, intersective adjectives, but we have to be on the lookout for these context-dependent effects. Um, a note on compounds, which I'm going to uh, 
I'm going to skip, but I want to say we, we're going to want to restrict our attention to real cases of modifier head combinations and not uh, not take compounds as uh, things that such a theory should account for. Then the summary of this part is just that apparent counterexamples to one or another theory of how we combine simple concepts to get the interpretations of compound ones. Apparent counterexamples may be evidence not against the theory in question, but against the inclusion of certain modifiers among the intersective adjectives. As some, some apparent counterexamples may be just uh, examples that don't belong in the domain of that theory in the first place. In the case of prototype theory, the domain should just be the combination of simple concepts whose basic semantics is intersection. And we'll have enough problems within that simple class. Now, the Osherson and Smith challenge um, is they argue that compositionality requirements pose problems for prototype theory. Some of their arguments can be answered as soon as one abandons the use of fuzzy set theory, which I'll say a word about in a minute as a way of dealing with combinations of vague concepts. But others of their challenges cannot be dealt with so simply and raise very interesting theoretical and empirical questions. So how does a concept determine what things fall under it and what things do not? Well, according to Osherson and Smith, prototype theory in its basic form construes membership in a concept's extension as graded, determined by similarity to the concept's best exemplar, the thing we're calling the prototype. And while proto now this is not their theory, this is their representation of the theory that they are then criticizing, but it, it's, it's at least a general simple representation of the theory. And while prototype theory is not presumed by anyone to apply to all concepts, Osherson and Smith assume, as do we, that if it applies to simple concepts, like, for instance, striped and apple, it should apply to compound concepts like striped apple as well. And that's where the challenge begins. So they say, suppose a concept is given as a complex consisting of a prototype and a function measuring the extent to which a given object differs from that prototype. So apple is characterized by a pair, P sub A, meaning the, the prototype of apple, and D sub A representing the distance of various potential apples from that prototype, striped similarly by a pair P sub S, prototypical striped things, and D sub S, a distance uh, from more or less uh, proto distance from that prototype. A suitable compositional procedure should then derive from these an appropriate pair P sub S A, a prototypical striped apple, D sub S A, distance from the prototypical striped apple, characterizing the combination striped apple. And Osherson and Smith argue that there's no general procedure that will produce intuitively correct results for arbitrary combinations. Um, now, more precisely, they represent concepts as quadruples. I'm going to try not to, not to get bogged down in technical parts. I know this is a very mixed audience. I have these things here for those that are interested in them, but I'll try to say in words what's going on um, in these cases. Uh, but the, the ingredients needed in the quadruple will include something like a conceptual domain for relevant potential examples of the concept in question, a distance measure uh, reflecting relative similarity among these examples, the prototype, and this c little c as a graded membership function or characteristic function which will assign to any object in this potential domain a number somewhere between 0 and 1, where 1 means it's a perfectly good example of whatever the concept is. 0 means it's absolutely not an example of that thing. And the numbers in between represent this, this graded rather than all or none notion of is it or is it not a, a such and such. Uh, now, one assumption that Osherson and Smith make um, in, in absence of other hypotheses available to them is that the best available mechanism for combining such uh, vague concepts is fuzzy logic. And this was, the, this was the first thing we wanted to challenge and the original inspiration for our writing this paper. Though 
once we got past that part, we found lots of other hard and interesting questions uh, remained. So let me illustrate the fuzzy logic problem with, I know this will turn away a few people, but I, I, I like this stuff, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Uh, with the case of apple, which is not an apple, which we think should come out as a contradictory, we and Osherson and Smith think should come out as a contradictory concept, but which fuzzy logic makes come out as a non-contradictory uh, concept. So the way, in the briefest possible terms, the way fuzzy logic works, if something is a is 0.5 apple, meaning it's on the borderline between whether you would call it an apple or not. Maybe it's a, one of those oriental pairs crossed with an apple. That would get very close to a borderline. Um, if, if something counts as a 0.5 apple, it's also going to count as a 0.5 non-apple, and therefore it's going to count as a 0.5 apple which is not an apple, um, whereas we think nothing should count as an apple which is not an apple. Um, and it's also going to count as 0.5 either is or is not an apple, whereas we think that should come out true, that something either is or is not an apple, whether you decide, whichever way you decide, uh, it, should, it should count as an apple. Um, so this particular problem can be easily solved by replacing fuzzy logic with a more uh, suitable theory of vagueness. Other problems that are harder will remain. Um, so I think now I think uh, I think I won't run through the details of the demonstration of the inadequacies of fuzzy set theory. Um, the main point that emerges that, that that's at the basis, at the heart of all these critiques of it, is that fuzzy set theory starts by trying to assign these numbers that correspond to degrees of truth of the proposition, is this an apple, is this not an apple, and then tries to define all the corresponding logical operations like negation, uh, conjunction, disjunction as operations on these numbers. And, and one can demonstrate that you just haven't given yourself an, enough information if you reduce it all to numbers and try to just operate on the numbers. You need to give yourself something that's more like a probability space or you have things that are more like sets, and you can look at set intersection and have measures on the intersection uh, of the sets. Uh, so the more adequate theory uh, is that we talk about is something called supervaluation theory, which I also don't want to try to go into the technical details of. But it starts from the basic notion that uh, you give your, you, you start out with a certain vague concept. What you have are some clear yeses some clear no's to the question of, say, is this furniture or whatever. And you have a large range of cases in between where there's not a definite answer once and for all. And then you consider all the possible ways of filling in the unclear area, all the, all the consistent ways of dividing the, your whole universe into yeses and no's. And then you examine the truth values of the various complex sentences that you've put together to see what happens to those sentences if you fill in the vagueness gap in all the possible consistent ways. And if it turns out that the sentence in question comes out true, no matter how you fill in the, the vague area, then you should count that sentence as definitely true. If it comes out false, no matter how you fill in the vague area, you should count it as definitely false. If it comes out true in some ways of filling it in and false in others, then it stays as a sentence that doesn't have a definite truth value. That's quite different from first picking a, a number like 0.5 and then trying to do everything on those simple numbers. So this theory is, is definitely more complex but correspondingly richer. Uh, so. I've, I've given an example on page five. I've given actually a couple examples on page five. I won't go through the details, but if you want to ask me about any of these in the question period, I'd be glad to. Let me just mention some of the results of, com of comparison that are at the top of uh, page, page six. And these are, are cases where fuzzy set theory can't tell these Part, cases apart, but we've 
I've, I've constructed an example uh, on, on page five where we suppose that the line between boy and man is vague, and we suppose that the line between child and adult is vague, and that we don't necessarily draw those, the two lines in exactly the same place. Um, but we do suppose that nothing can count simultaneously as being a boy and being a man. So that if you, if you say yes to counting this as boy in some particular filling in of the vagueness, you're going to simultaneously say no to counting it as a man. And similarly for child and adult. Um, then with, the, with, with that and with certain constraints um, on what we think the linkages between these, these different concepts should be, uh, it can come out that if Bob is a child, then Bob is a boy will come out true, because it will be true in all the different ways of filling out the vagueness. But if Bob is a child, then Bob is a man will come out false. Uh, although, given the particular... Um, uh, data, I've, I've constructed this example, Bob, as a real borderline case, given the, the um, choices there, fuzzy logic would find it impossible to assign different truth values to those two sentences, because numerically, Bob is exactly on the borderline of both of those, um, equally on the borderline of boy and man. Or similarly, if Bob is a boy, then Bob is an adult, that will come out indeterminate on the way this example is set up. But if Bob is a man, then Bob is an adult. That will come out true in this case, et cetera. Um, in fact, even, yeah, even the pair E and F uh, cannot be distinguished by fuzzy logic. So E is, if Bob is a boy, then Bob is a man. That should come out false. But for this guy who is 0.5 on the borderline, fuzzy logic won't make that one come out false. If Bob is a man, then Bob is a man. That should come out true. But by the fuzzy logic manipulations, that will come out identical to the preceding sentence. So, okay. So, so you can ask me about details if you want, but we have knocked down arguments against uh, fuzzy logic. I sh for those interested in, in fuzzy logic related things, I should say that name, fuzzy logic, has by now been applied to a really wide range of theories. So, what this is a critique of classical fuzzy logic and doesn't necessarily apply to all of the more modern things that go by that name. Now I must also come back before going on to uh, um, the, the last couple bits um, to this question of contradictions and tautologies because I said earlier that for instance apple which is not an apple should count as a contradictory concept. Well, actually, some of the advocates of fuzzy logic have argued that the fact that sentences like Bob is a man and not a man may very well come out as 0.5 true on, on their approach is a virtue of their theories. You know, whereas many, most of the, the, the classical logicians and semanticists are saying Bob is a man and not a man should come out as false on any literal interpretation of the sentence. Now, here's a, here's a debate, and clearly there are intuitions both ways. We know that we use sentences like that to say things that are not contradictory, but sh should that count as, as part of the literal meaning or not? What's, what's the best account of both the general logical properties of sentences and their actual uses? This is a real challenge for... for uh, anybody to sort out, or on the other. Similarly, this apple is either red or not red. Um, that's going to come out as true on the supervaluation approach. On the if if color terms apply to apples at all, if we're not trying to say electricity is either red or not red, if color terms apply, then something that is either red or not red are going to come out true on on the on the logical approach, including the supervaluation approach to vague terms. And fuzzy logic says, oh, but that's a terrible result and we won't get that result. Well, on our analysis, sentences like 29 and 30 are literally contradictions and tautologies, respectively. But in actual use, they get reconstrued according to principles that we think we can begin to articulate so as to impose some non-contradictory or non-tautologous interpretation. That's, that's then our challenge to see if we can, 
can have our cake and eat it too, so to speak, in that way. Um, well, suppose that you try to take a sentence of the form of 29, this is an X and is not an X, and suppose you get much more specific about the respects in which you're judging these predicates and turn 29 into 31. Bob is a man with respect to age and gender and not a man with respect to age and gender. Now we have something that's much harder to, to hear as anything other than a contradiction. That's, to our mind, one bit of evidence that, in fact, what we do when we hear sentences like Bob is a man and not a man is to suppose that our speaker means, well, according to some of the kinds of relevant criteria, he is a man. According to some other kinds of relevant criteria, he isn't. As he's a man in some respects and not a man in other respects. Uh, so that, that suggests we normally reconstrue things like 29 uh, as in 32. Bob is a man in such and such respects and not a man in such and such other respects. Now that sentence is clearly not contradictory. So if, if what we do with sentences like 29 is reconstrue them as 32 in order to find something that the speaker was saying that wasn't a flat out contradiction, that would account for the fact that such sentences are usable without suggesting that we want to mess with the laws of logic at all. So that X is an A and not an A, that's a contradiction. When you hear sentences that sound that way and you can find some other construal to put on them, like A in some respects, not A in others, then you can get to some, an interpretation that's not a contradiction. So we believe that, uh, uh, we, we believe that in fact, it's the very contradictoriness of the literal meaning that drives us to find some other reconstrual. So that it, in fact, what we actually do in understanding such sentences can be used as an argument for classical logic as it is. Um, here's another case, similar point, but in a different, uh, different direction. Consider some object that's on the borderline between being an animal and being a vegetable, at least for those of us who are not professionals when we say first encounter a sea anemone or something. You know, don't, don't, know, don't know what it is. So, so, you're, so it's somewhere, somewhere on the borderline between animal or vegetable. You don't know which. And consider the sentence, this is animal or vegetable. If the thing is on the borderline between animal and vegetable, then we're inclined to say that that sentence is true. As we may not know which, but we know it's animal or vegetable. Um, by fuzzy logic, if the thing was 0.5 animal, 0.5 vegetable, as uncertain, it would come out 0.5 animal or vegetable. That's not a welcome result. Whereas on the supervaluation theory, it will come out true because no matter where you draw the line between animals or vegetables, whether to include or exclude this unclear case, it will come out in one set or the other. And that will account for the fact that it comes out in true in all the consistent completions of the original partial model. Okay. Um, now, striped apples. Okay, so, so that's sort of the end of the parts that, that can be taken care of just by getting rid of fuzzy logic, replacing it by, by this more adequate supervaluation theory. Um, but then lots of other interesting problems still remain. The striped apple problem is, the pro is another problem raised by Osherson and Smith, and it's the problem that an object that may seem close, that subjects will judge as close to a prototypical striped apple. And these are all just pictures of things they're judging in these experiments. They aren't real um, apples. So they're, the pictures have things that look kind of weird to me. They're sort of apple-like things with zebra-like stripes, you know, but, which is very far from my notion of a prototypical striped apple that just has little shadings of red and green near the top. But anyway... What comes out, however you construe these things, and there's lots of examples that, that seem to come out like this, is an object that's judged close to, prototyp to prototypical as a striped apple often comes out on subjects' judgments to, be, to have a higher value on striped apple judgments than it does on either the judgments of 
how good an instance of striped things it is or how good an instance of apple it is. And this is a result that neither fuzzy logic nor supervaluation theory would predict, that something could be a better example of a striped apple than it is either of striped or uh, apple. So what happens here? Well, this is where the midget giants come in. This is where we, we suggest a diagnosis of the problem to the effect that linguistic structure has effects on contextual uh, recalibrations of the ranges of vague concepts, of where you draw cutoff lines for vague concepts. And that's what I'm about to illustrate. So stay on page six a minute and look at the three, um, three sentences at the bottom. Sam is a giant and a midget. Sam is a giant midget. Sam is a midget giant. Now, we haven't done any systematic experiments, but it's our impression from asking lots of our friends as well as ourselves that people will in general interpret those three sentences all differently. That um, the common judgment for the first one, Sam is a giant and a midget, is that that one's contradictory unless, as in the earlier case, you impose something about indifferent respects on the, on the two. Uh, so the giant and midget seem to be given kind of parallel status. Whereas in Sam is a giant midget, I think we all agree he's a real large midget. He's a midget, but lar very large for a midget. Whereas Sam is a midget giant, he's got to be a giant, but very small among his community of giants. Okay. Um, now, the dynamics of what's going on here. Uh, well, examples like these and others lead us to uh, hypothesize uh, that there are a number of very general effects that, that uh, affect the interpretation of vague, uh, vague lexical items in particular linguistic constructions. So one, well, we have just three here. Well, two of them sort of specific, the other one really very general. Um, the parallel structure effect. Whenever you put things in a conjoined structure, you are in effect...